My name is Mark Solinsky, and I'm a uh, career analyst in the Department of Defense for 36 years. Um, I speak only for myself. I don't think too many people in the Department of Defense would strongly disagree with what I have to say today. I don't think it's particularly controversial, uh, but it is my views. Um, I cover the Mideast for some time. Uh, if you have some extra money in your pocket, please go on Amazon and buy my books. But I do have a book coming out, we'll probably have about six or seven months on Iran, in particular on the Revolutionary Guard Corps. I certainly welcome. Oh, he passed us by. Please, we welcome you. Oh, but there's no food in here. Oh, no food. Well, I don't know what to say. No, we can ignore it. We can accommodate. All right. So that's who I am. This is my daughter, Leia. And Leia is an intern at the National Defense University. Uh, once again, her views are her own. Uh, this is where I'm going to go through. Uh, I'm going to ask Leia in about 20 minutes or so, but you signal me, and I'll wrap it up and turn it over to Leia. And uh, uh, we are being recorded, yes? Okay, so everything's going lucky dory. And then I'll turn it over to, and if you have any questions too, perhaps, if we can't answer your questions now and you give me your email, I will not, you know, I will give you as thorough as answer, an answer as I possibly can. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas. We're going to excite me too. What is the added value to you? I hope at the end of this, you'll be able to see this maybe through a more refined or a new prism. That is, when you talk about all the and his ideas, you can now have this in the context of other ideologies that existed with it, some of which don't exist anymore, um, and some of it which may morph into more potent elements in the future. Leia will be talking about, sir, Leia will be talking about our center, and it's interesting, independently, we were doing some research, and we talked, and we found out that this would be a great paper to do. I think it's important to understand this. Sun Tzu was one of the great military thinkers really of all time. He said that the most important thing is to understand your enemy. If you can't understand your enemy, you can't develop any kind of plan or strategy. Now, there was a woman who was speaking just a moment ago who did not think that Iran was the enemy. Okay, and that, I disagree. I think that it is certainly an enemy. But unless you see it that way and understand it, you can't take appropriate action. Imagine if in 1933, 1934, 1935, many European leaders had a clearer read on the intentions of Hitler. He had already written Mein Kampf. The information was out there. But there was a tendency for many people to say, wait a minute, what he is saying is so ugly, he couldn't really believe it. Well, he did believe it. Really, it's the same thing with, with Lenin, too. Many people at the time, 1917, 1918, 1920, that kind of thing, they knew there was a problem there. And this is when you did have a deportation. But they, many American thinkers did not fully understand the, the threat that communism held to the uh, Russian people and to others. We know that Russia, we know that they are building the atomic bomb. That can no longer be denied in Iran. Unless we understand the philosophy that impels its creation, perhaps it's used, we can understand virtually nothing. Important is simply a, a festival. I wanted to just coincidentally, yesterday was Noruz, and of course that's very important in, um, in uh, in Shia Islam, and in Iran in particular, it goes back, it's ancient, it's Persia. It's interesting too because today is Purim. Now, this was the first time that you had a genocidal plot to kill all the Jews in any given country, and this was a plot by a man named Haman, a very evil man, and the celebration, you celebrate once a year, his failing to kill off all the Jews in Persia. In fact, it was he, Haman, who went to the gallows. This man is Julius Stryker. He, even among Nazis, was vicious. He was one of the theoreticians, too. He was hanged after Nuremberg on Purim, right, today, and his last words were Purim Festival, Purim Fest. This 
man is? Stalin. And guess on what day he died? Purim too. Had he not died on this date, many Jews would have been deported to uh, Azerbaijan out in the east and would have died. Now, what does this have to do with what I said I would talk about? I am saying that there are certain things as existential threats, and I put it to you, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, the world will change. I think you're going to try to make a case why it might. Can you define Khomeinism? The ism. Well, I think you can. I think we can define, for example, Hitlerism or Stalinism. What do we do? We take a look at the philosophy, the plan, what they attempted to do, how successful they did it. And then we can define that, too. The Soviets used the term Hitlerism a lot more than we did. We were generally at war with Germany. But what were the ideologies? What motivated the German people to fight to the very end? And that was Hitlerism, too. Now, there's a hazard about using the term, too. It can be tossed around capriciously or inaccurately whenever you have an ism, too. People will say repeatedly, George Bush is, is a fascist. He believes in fascism. Okay, I'm not saying that's true or not. I'm just saying you would have to define exactly what that is. Is Nancy Pelosi a communist? Does she believe in communism? I would tend to say she probably does not. But we have to be very clear, and that's the whole purpose really of this briefing. You know, there are a lot of ideas in Iran at the time. The 20th century, it was quite a time for Iran. You had one dynasty come to an end, and then you had a two-man dynasty, and these, of course, were the Pahlavis. The first was Reza Shah, and he was a six-foot-five-inch Cossack Persian. They called him machine gun because he was the only guy big enough to carry the machine gun around. Does he fit into any of these? You know, it's a funny thing, because he was liberal in that he wanted to liberalize some of the economy and make it more competitive. He went and he took a look at the West, and he said, no, things aren't going very well here, but they keep our, they're modern, their weapons are better. Everything they do is kind of similarly better than what we do. Another idea, too, was communism. Communism, too, in this country, too. Europe became the battleground for communism and fascism. We'll talk a little bit about some of these ideas more specifically. Communism never really took off in Iran for the same reason it's never taken off in other Muslim countries. When the Soviets were at their most adroit at ruling Muslims, they did it in the Caucasus and in the stands because they let them practice their religion and they soft-pedaled how atheistic and anti-religion communism was. You had some Armenians in the Communist Party in Iran, but not much beyond that. What you did have, though, is kind of a green-red coalition. Green for Islam, red for communism. So you took elements of both. Al-Ahmed, in 1962, wrote West Toxification. The idea is this, that we, are, that we Iranians are exploited by the West. Take a look at Western or McDonald's. Take a look at, they may not have had that then, but any kind of movies. And take a look at our youth. We're being led to them. The West will destroy the very essence of what it means to be Muslim, to be Shia, and uh, to be Iranian. And therefore, we have to fight that. You cannot call this exactly communism, but it would have resonated among the left. It also would have resonated among many of the angry youth, too, who wanted to look for an idea. Why are we looking this way? It's the fault of the West. You would take an idea of Marxism, that is kind of a dialectic materialism, but as many, Europe, as many Iranian elites studied in Europe, they would bring back these new ideas. Franz Fanon, for example, Sartre Lenin, and they would fuse a lot of this together. And they would build a, a layer of that. Khomeini was never a communist. He was very anti-communist. But what he did salute was the mobilizing ability of many communists. He looked at Lenin, and he said, Lenin was a guy who knew how to get things done. You know, I tell you, the two of them probably had more in common than they had things apart. Now, that which they had apart was very different. But if you would have had, for example, Hitler and Stalin, Stalin thought he could work with Hitler because they had a very similar mindset. Now, the difference 
was on race, and that was too consuming for Hitler. Stalin didn't know that, but these too many people saw the world in very similar ways. First of all, the world would be ruled by a dictatorship. They are ruthless people. How many pictures have you seen of either men smiling? You really didn't see. They don't smile a lot. You see pictures of Stalin smiling, Hitler smiled, famous pictures when they conquered France. But these people really didn't. The whole world was one of framed by anger. And above all, people are out to get you. It's zero sum. That is this, intractable enemies. But if we do destroy them, then we can do something. We can create a utopia. Today, it's very hard for any of us to see what is attractive about, other, about either of these men. Similarly, Adolf Hitler appealed to a certain type of person. Today's German, I think, would have a hard time understanding why they were, uh, why they were um, so attractive. This is a picture just of Henry Fonda. He never converted to, to Islam, I can assure you. But this comes from the movie The Grapes of Wrath. And there's a feeling in the grapes of wrath to John Steinbeck, he would have met, they would have understood, that the world is one really of suffering. Here Tom Joe comes out of a prison of Oklahoma, all right, he was in murder, and you don't know a lot about it, but then you have the dust bowl, it stops raining, the crops go. He has to take care of his parents, so they go on Route 66 to California. Along the way, they never hurt anybody, but they get beaten up, and they get flat tires, and people die. And there's this fatalism, and there's a soliloquy at the end about, about this, about how difficult and unfair the world is. Now, this is not the only theme in Iranian Persian folklore, but it is a dominant theme. And I, help, I think it helps to frame the way they kind of see things. Islamism is what I call is a kind of Sunni political Islam. This comes from the Islamic Brotherhood. You may have heard about, about that that this is the idea of taking, mobilizing, and moving into civil society. Now, after the end of the caliphate in 1925 or so, Hassan al-Banna was an Egyptian school teacher, and he came in, and he was a brilliant organizer, and he said, and many Muslims say this quite often, we are in our state because we have left Islam. We have to go back to Islam. We have to live our lives as pure Muslims. Then things will get better. Madhuri was the Indian, now Pakistani leader, and he was very dominant in the subcontinent. But the two, these two dominant themes are creating an Islamic state on Earth. Sayyid Qutb II is a very important man. He wrote The America I Saw. He was more or less the intellectual engine behind the Brotherhood. He came to the United States. I strongly recommend, it was not a book, it was a long track that came out. And if you saw the movie, oh, The Looming Tower, it was a book about 9-11. It begins with this, and what he saw, and how important he was. Um, fascism, too, is another idea that was floating around. And I put it to you, much like some of the elements of the other ideologies, you can find this in Khomeiniism. Giovanni Gentile was the architect of fascism, all within the state, none outside it, none against it. Adolf Hitler would probably not have referred to himself as a fascist. He was a national socialist. But he was a great admirer of Mussolini for a number of reasons. And for many years, he was the junior partner to him. <clears throat> and once again, this is the elder Shah in particular. He saw what was going on in Germany, how they were rebuilding themselves from the First World War. He liked the martial spirit, the pageantry, the weapons. Uh, the name changed in 1936 from Persia to Iran, and that's a story into itself. But once again, these were some of the ideas that were coming along. Here again, you have this issue of race. Hitler referred in very derogatory terms to Egyptians in particular, and their foreign ministry had to work with that, but they made Muslims honorary Asian, honorary Aryans, pardon me. Now this is where he comes to a Shia revivalism. I really separate this out from Islamism because I want to hold on to that as Sunni. I have to stress one thing. Hassan al-Banna, the architect of the mother, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, 
was not anti-Shia. <clears throat> and there is. There's a huge historic divide, and sometimes they live together, sometimes they don't. Hassan al-Mana saw Shia as the fifth school of Islamic jurisprudence. You know the, the four schools of that. So she wanted to bring them in and make some concessions and work with them. Now this is a name that not a lot of people know in particular. Safafi was a very important too. He is uh, Ali Shariati. He was not trained as as uh, uh, as other people were not trained. Said so Qutb were not trained or credentialed in Islam, but he studied it deeply and he fused many ideas. He went to Paris, Gramsci, this who was very popular on American campuses. Malcolm X was coming online in the 1960s. So you use the term intersectionality, you use it in the United States today. He was one who saw this. He talked about two types of black and Shia, of Shia Islam, the black and the red. Red being more dynamic, and that's what he wanted to bring. The idea is this, that the 12th Imam, and I can't go into too many details, but imagine a messianic cult that bringing and the book of Revelation coming, and everything that you, people, the good people will go up and the bad people will go down. You will live every day as though this would happen. And it's a kind of revivalism, too, where people became excited and started chanting, became very, very excited indeed. You know, I, well, this is Shariat, and this is Sayyid Kutub, and it would have been something if the two had a cup of coffee, because I'm trying to link now the school of Islamism to uh, the kind of the Shia revivalism. Both had experiences in the West, in Europe, in France in particular, and in the United States, but they came away with some kind of admiration and, and a fear of it, but the idea that the West is toxic and that the West is the number one enemy. I think you find this too in, in Egypt today. Some people have this fear. Okay, so I want to bring together some different, some points of convergence uh, when it comes to these ideologies. And I talk about the four, the kind of Shia revivalism, Islamism, fascism, and communism. They all are anti-democratic. They think that democrat democracy is unnatural, it is weak, it leads to an effete people. They all see themselves as being victims. Not necessarily by one victim, but perhaps by a series of victims. I don't think that that is necessarily the feeling, for example, in the United States. It's not, not a common theme, I would argue. Now, they have a, a, a focus on implacable enemies. That is, we are at war, and it's either going to be you or me. When the, in the political, the silly season goes on, you'll hear a lot of Republicans talking in one way and a lot of Democrats talking another way, too. I don't think that they would generally be as an existential war. For many of these people, it was. For the Germans, the Nazis in particular, it was the international Jew. From the communists, it was the capitalists. Um, from the, in Shia, from the Sunni school, the Islamism, it would really be the United States. Uh, the Shia is a little bit different too, but there are many. Uh, there is a mandate for change. Okay, now that they are armed with this wisdom, you're going to have to do something, because after all, they are utopic societies. Shia will have a utopia when the 12th Imam comes, but you can bring events, you can come about that will bring that. One of them could be the nuclear weapons, which concerns me. Uh, the Sunni too, the Salafis in particular, the closer we live to the time of the originators, the first generation of Muslims, the purer and better we, we could be. Now, one example of this, well, it didn't work out, the Islamic State, or Daesh, or ISIS, ISIL. That is exactly how they try to live. Uh, they did not find utopia. I was told that they were declared dead yesterday, right? Mandate for change also, and anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism is linked to all of these. Now, there are three points of disagreement. Communism is, athe is atheistic, and it's not going to make any inways with Islamism or Shia revivalism. There's nothing in either in both of those groups that would make it pro-communist. 
And one of the mandates in this one, right, the five pillars would be to give alms too. But that's not the Christianity, you would have that too. You would help the poor. Um, but it doesn't have anything to do with communism. Then there is a difference in utopia, a very difference. One being racial, one being a, um, an absence of any classes, and the other two based on Islam. And so this is, I think they all come together, some of these ideas come together under Khomeinism. Now, I put it to you that it's very important to understand this because I believe they mean what they say. I am as convinced that they mean what they say is what Hitler meant when he said it in the North, or, or Lenin or Stalin. These people mean business. Because many of us aren't religious, we don't have this as our passion. We're not aggressive. Doesn't mean that others don't. <clears throat> I am not saying that the rank and file Iranians believe in this. Many of them don't. They were, in many ways, liberalizing until it was detoured. Uh, with the Islamic Revolution. Uh, but God help us if they do get nuclear weapons. Um, I'd like to turn this over now, if I may, to my better half here at this. And um, I brought some of these, she's given this. Here you are. This is just what you have up here. Okay. This would just be a way to. Uh, Oh, good. Did I get absolutely for the lady, the gentlemen? Oh, good. One more. That's exactly. I got it right for once in my life. Okay. So now Leah will. Oh, we're in good shape in time. We'll we'll talk about the um, rest. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is the committed arts in post-revolutionary Iran and the Soviet Union, and the reason why this is relevant to humanism in general is because the committed arts were a way to disseminate an idea or a revolutionary ideal to a mass audience and the average person isn't necessarily a political expert they don't necessarily know the minutiae of foreign policy and in any country necessarily but because the committed arts in both societies used a lot of symbolic colors and reference key historical and cultural events to give off a particular idea or ideology, the average person could understand this. Um, overall, I argue that the, the committed arts in both societies share more similarities than they do differences. Um, and much of that has to do with the history of cultural interaction between Iran and the Soviet Union. For example, in Iran, there was a journal circulated uh, called Panami, um, Payami Na. And it actually referenced uh, Trotsky when Trotsky said that art was something that was committed to serving the people. Um, there was an idea that art wasn't a frivolous ac activity for the aristocracy. It was a tool used to mobilize people across different levels of society, different classes, all mobilize them and unify them and create national solidarity. This is something that would be appealing to any revolution um, or any country with a set ideology that it wants to promote. Um, to start off with, uh, an example of this is a mural of Khomeini in Revolution Avenue in Tehran. Uh, what's important about this is that um, overall Iran's method of dissemination was through use of murals while the Soviet Union um, used posters. And there are a few key elements that stand out. First of all, the style that the individuals are drawn in is uh, in a very realistic style. This was done on purpose. In the Soviet Union, um, the politicized arts were specifically done in a realistic style. Uh, many art, this wasn't only in the arts, this was in film, literature. Um, part of it was because with using the realistic style was a very direct way to show, at least in the Soviet Union, a moment of coming to class consciousness. And in general, the more realistic something is, the less, the, the less of the room there is for interpretation. If something is highly abstract, many people can interpret it different ways. The more realistic something is, there's a more narrow area of interpretation and it makes it far easier to disseminate a certain idea to a lot of people. Um, additionally, it can be inferred that this was created during the Iran-Iraq War in Iran um, because uh, this was a period specifically which uh, commissioned many murals. You see Khomeini, so again this idea of reinforcing the power of a national leader, revolutionary leader, with soldiers. Um, there's the use of uh, Shiite green, which is very a symbolic color um, in Shiite Islam. 
And um, again, the way that it's positioned was highly strategic so that many people would see this on a very busy avenue. Overall, in terms of the um, points of convergence, the use of color in the committed arts in both societies was highly symbolic. In Iran, there was a, the use of green, whereas in Soviet art, there was uh, the use of red. The art was strategically located and disseminated. In Iran, um, the location was more important because you would have one massive mural, but it would be on a very busy and visible um, street. Whereas in the Soviet Union, you had a mass campaign of posters and it was recorded uh, by an American journalist in 1921 that the, you walk everywhere around the Soviet Union, you see flyers and posters everywhere, on benches, uh, streetcars, everywhere. So where you put them wasn't as important, but it was important that many people see them. Um, the art was done to create national sentiment, support for the revolution, and revolutionary leaders. Um, art was commissioned by political bodies and committees. An example of this is the um, Artistic and Cultural Bureau of the Combs Seminary Office of Propaganda in Iran and the Political Administration of Military Commissariat of Kiev in the Soviet Union. So this reinforces the idea that this art was um, very, well obviously political, it wasn't something that people did on their own, this was commissioned by specific political bodies. Um, and if you want to look at examples of Soviet posters, again you see the hyper-realistic style um, so there's little room for interpretation and uh, the use of red. Here you have uh, Lenin leading the workers. Um, it says the workers and Lenin and he's clearly, he's in front of them, it's very symbolic, he's leading them towards a better future. Here you have, this was, uh, this was created by Alexander Rachenko in 1924. It's a, a poster of Lilia Brick who was associated with the um, Soviet Union's cultural avant-garde. She's saying books. Um, so it's reinforcing the idea of spreading education to everywhere, using education as a way to have everyone agree with you, um, again, spread revolutionary ideals. And the differences um, are probably more superficial than anything, even in terms of the ideologies um, spread. One, they're both utopian, but the difference is that the Soviet Union viewed religion as something which needed to be removed in order to create um, a good society, whereas uh, in Iran, it was the opposite view, that more religion was needed in order to create a good society. Oh, thank you very much. And um, so we'd like to conclude here, art serving this incomplete sentence, but we talked a little bit about Khomeiniism, and that's a convergence uh, of many ideas into something that is unique. Um, I do believe that it poses a tremendous threat for a number of reasons. It's not within the scope now, I'm wrapping it up, but you see the expansionism, you see the Shia crescent growing. These people are effective and they're very good at doing what they're doing. Um, you see all the points of convergence and divergence of all. And, um, you also, as, as Leah mentioned, how the idea of the arts serves to propagate ideas. So uh, thank you very much, and if you have any questions of either of us, we would love to uh, try to field them. <laughs> Sir. Okay. Um, one philosopher you didn't mention was Rousseau. Okay. And Khomeini spent a fair amount of time in France. And I've always been struck by the parallel between the system of the leader, the supreme leader, even though you have a democratic system, very similar to the system um, Rousseau uh, advocated in the social contract, in which you had the lawgiver mm. to correct the mistakes of the populace through their democratic election. And I've always wondered whether um, Khomeini got the idea from Rousseau he might, I don't think that comes out. It, it, I don't know in, in his writings. I, I haven't really heard yeah. that association. Now, <clears throat> it, would, it would not surprise, I could have, absolutely, it would come out secondarily through all these Shariati I mentioned, men I mentioned there. So, um, some of these ideas, you would have Rousseau, and then you would have, I guess, Marx kind of finding his way or Rousseau through. But the idea that, let's see, man, man is born free but is in shame. No, I mean just specifically that one item. Not the whole philosophy, the but idea the idea of the, 
of the law given. Yeah, well, that would be. It sounds in keeping the idea that this is a little bit different. In Sunni Islam, uh, you would have consensus and authority as guides. For example, uh, authority would be all Azhar University. And you've seen people, and they look like they have the Santa Claus hats with the red and the white. Um, and then consensus is how the community uh, sees something. This effectively is how Muhammad's successors were selected by, by the consensus. In, in Shia Islam, it's different. You have the rule of the jurist. That's it, that you would take the ideas, in this case, from Allah or from the Quran, and then you would distill it down so that people and interpret it with kind of a broad interpretation. That sounds credible to me if I got that right, yeah? Sir. Over the last uh, <clears throat> few decades, um, the Iranian government has been exposed as being extraordinarily corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, not just uh, you know, not just reports by external agencies, but the average person on the street knows that he or she is living under a pretty corrupt regime, and um, its legitimacy has been challenged quite a bit over the last few years. Um, so one would wonder whether, first, it remains dangerous because it, there's a possibility it could just implode or collapse mm -hmm. due to popular dissatisfaction. Um, but part of whether it remains dangerous would be, and this, you know, asking your opinion on this, is whether, do you think the clerics in Iran, given their behavior, you know, given their, I mean, one, one might have some doubts as to whether the clerics actually themselves are atheists or, <laughs> or, or religious people. Given their behavior, I'm wondering um, whether they might be uh, as dangerous as one might think. In other words, for example, this whole idea that they might take nukes to, yeah. to bring about uh, yeah. an event to, uh, to bring about the return of the 12th yeah. you know, One would believe that. Maybe. They do. They, 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 but I'm convinced that they absolutely, for you, for somebody not to believe this would be to continue to say again and again and again, no, what, they're not serious about what they say. They've been doing this for 40 years now. They've been living their life this way. It's vast corruption in there because it has infected all elements of society, particularly through the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. You have a lot of stakeholders in a corrupt system. It took the 70 or 80 years for the Soviet Union to go away, but they didn't have anything in their philosophy like this about the idea that they could bring a paradise on earth. They know which way they're going. It's the same thing with suicide bombers. What kind of mindset is this? That's irrational behavior. Well, it's not entirely irrational. If you're a dead-ender and you know that you can get to heaven by blowing yourself up, then you can be a rational actor. See, what, what, I, what I'm asking is, is it consistent for a person who steals, who lies, is it, is it possible for such a person to believe in God and believe in that, and that, in fact, he can take actions that would bring about the return of the 12th? I would say it is. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that there are people who believed in homicidal, vicious belief systems, who had no problem about lying or stealing. Hitler lied, stealed. Uh, and yet at the same time, and he brought his, his people to an undergone. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm not sure you're getting where I'm going. I understand that about Hitler. What I'm saying is that, you know, if a person's been brought up in a particular religion from mm -hmm. childhood, one of the things that they're taught early on is you're supposed to be a good person. You don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, because this is part of our own. These people lie, they cheat, they yes. steal. And one would think that for them to do that, 
at some point they abandon their action and leave it. And they're just using it as a matter of gaining power and exercising Well, I, I, can, I can answer an element of that. As far as lying and deceiving, this is part, it's called takia. And, and there's takia takaya kitman. But you can lie in Islam if it prevents discord or fitna in, in a society. You can lie also to shield yourself. Takia came in response to many Shia living under Sunnis, and the Sunnis saw that the Shia were not true Muslims, that they were some breakaway sect. So they, they lied. That's about the best answer I can give you. If anybody else has a view, oh, I'd love to hear that. I mean, one of the teeth is wars to see from Muhammad. Muhammad said right. wars to see, yeah. And yeah, it's a, uh, if, if you truly uh, follow the doctrine that jihad is an imperative in Islam, then all of the various tactics and techniques that can further that uh, militant jihad are acceptable, like deception. I mean, I mean combatants use deception of warfare all the time, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's different than that. I, I know what you're, you're saying. I mean, you're, you're pushing in a, a little bit, a bit of a cracking a little bit of the door. But for me, it's it's difficult to understand. Yeah, it's hard. You know, I I, I, I myself am convinced that many of these people who are clerics are in fact atheists. I, I can't. Some of them are real believers, you know, still. But um, it's hard for me to imagine that they. That, that and this is difficult. Do you have something to say? Well, part of it is just like um, ends justifies the means mentality. Like it could be religious or irreligious. If you have some kind of end goal that you want to accomplish and you view that goal um, as like the greater good, it, it's kind of like a human nature to ignore any other like moral law or rule that you feel would be like getting in your way almost. So it's like yeah, a human that's, nature. That's a, that's, that's a possible way. Ma'am? Oh, please do. Um, so, uh, a lot of the times what happens with religious doctrination is um, when, when uh, say, like, for instance, like, if you look at how people tend to be radicalized very often, uh, three years ago, right, and they didn't have this concept where, where you know, religion was taught to them through their parents early on in this specific way. But then what happens is, um, Say, like, say, for instance, if there's a religion in Pakistan, right? Um, they, they, because they have a lot of children, they're highly impoverished. They have no idea how they would be able to feed to all children, educate all of them. So they have this organization who come and they say, if you have a school, we're going to take some of you, take some of your children, we we'll feed them, we'll take care of their education, we we'll provide them, um, all the amenities, and then that they'll be able to go out and work, and then they'll be able to take care of you and your family. They give them their, ch their children, and then what happens over there is that, and then they're doing the documentaries, and, 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 you know, and this, this is not something that, it's just not something that I know from my own experience in my own research and stuff, it's, and it's, it's well documented. What happens in these uh, uh, sort of militia schools is that uh, they, will, they, they will teach the, the, the people the scripture, but it will be not in their own language. So they will learn, they will read the Quran, but they will read it in Arabic. And they have always learned to say Pashto, or they have learned Urdu, or they have learned Sindhi, or, you know, uh, one of those lines, or I mean, or, you know, whatever their, their, their languages are. So they're actually, when they, they, and then there will be someone who will be interpreting it for them, and they say this is what it means. So even if they're actually reading the text, they say that this is the, this is the word of God. The interpretation that they're getting is very distorted. And then the experience that they're having over there, it's, it's, it's as good as systematic starvation. It's, uh, and the, the, and they, the, there's no way that they can tell their parents can bring them back. They're, they're, they're just, uh, because their parents lack the resources, and that's why they give their children in the first place. So there's no way for these children to return home. So they start to believe that um, their life is hell. That it is hell not because of the, the of, of the people who are apprehending them, they see them as the benefactors who are providing for them, who are taking care of them, who are giving them the path back to God. And their, their, their condition, their hellish condition is because of the crusaders, the Zionists, the, the terrible Western consumer society that is providing them and the resources and 
and Johnny, who, uh, one of the leaders, who was called the Shah of Pistachios. He was one of the wealthiest people there, or the shark. Um, families, more than that, they marry into each other, like the, the Claudians of ancient Rome. So you have the Laranjanis now marrying into the Khomeini's, <clears throat> the Rafsanjanis. And you now, you know, they're joking about having hemophilia in the first family of the Mullahs in, 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 in Iraq. But, but there's vast corruption. It also creates a lot of stakeholders. But here, who holds the power? In the Soviet Union, it lingered. And had you not had the leaders you had then, it could have gone in a different direction. The Soviet Union could still be the Soviet. We don't know. There could have been a nuclear exchange. But you had people like Gorbachev and Yeltsin who were great reformers. That's why it happened that way. There's just a constellation. Uh, things, the, the, the stars were, were aligned for that. I don't see any of that happening here in Iran. If people starve and starve, uh, Venezuela. You know, if people starve, they starve. And Venezuela fall apart pretty quickly. Do we have any other questions, please? Young lady, young man. When we started our conversation about um, how the person who the ice connects to Sure. Yeah, the Baha'is, of all, of all the religions there, the Baha'is are particularly hated. And a lot of this is religiously driven. Because the Baha'is came maybe in the 19th century, and it was an idea that there were simply a series of prophets. Now, in Islam, in, both, in, in all schools, and in both sects, Shia and Sunni, they believed that Muhammad was the final prophet, and that the Quran is the perfect book. Therefore, they see anything, any kind of successive renditions of Islam as apostasy. Remember, in, in Islam, the crime for leaving the fate is death. Now, it's not always followed out, but you find this on the books in many countries. So the Baha'i are particularly disliked here. Essentially, one fellow said, I am now the gatekeeper, the Bob, and the, they call the other the Bobs. 
So they took refuge in what was then Palestine in the 1920s. Uh, the leadership did. That was in Haifa. It's a beautiful temple there with water running down. But when you had the re uh, religious fervor after the revolution, you saw a re imposition of anti-Semitism, which would have been seen as very low class in the 1970s and 1960s. Many of the Muslims took Jews as friends. And also a revitalization of hating Baha'is. Baha'is are particularly targeted and they were thrown in into prison and still languish there. It is something, I don't know why things like this don't really make the headlines, the, uh, or, or Christians. Uh, what Christians exist there? It just there's not that much of an interest. And that's all I can tell you about the Baha'is. Any other questions? I would thank you very much. Wonderful. Appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you.